times, the Roman army is praised for all their accomplishments and victories. The Eagle in 2011 and Centurion in 2010 are both recent films that feature this noteworthy army. Why are we so fascinated with the Romans? And what makes their reign so distinguished? The Roman army was the largest and most destructive army of its time. It was founded roughly around 753 BC, and it was destroyed in 486 AD, when the last emperor was dethroned. Throughout the growth of the Roman military, many reforms and changes were made. One of the more prevalent changes were made by Gaius Marius. Before his reforms, war and military were privileges to the wealthy. Military role was based upon which equipment one could purchase. The wealthiest soldiers were placed in the cavalry. Those who were eligible to serve in the army had to be between the ages of 17 and 46, be a taxpaying Roman citizen, and be a landowner. They could join the army for a chance to prove themselves worthy by returning with glory, which came in the form of land and money. These men had to swear an oath of allegiance called the Sacramentum to have a chance for this sought-after glory. The Sacramentum basically stated that whoever signed it was completely at the will of the general, and they could only be released by this oath by death or demobilization. If one did not take this oath seriously and serve their country, they were considered a disgrace. When Marius came around, he made the process of being accepted into the army more strict. Roman recruits had to pass the probato, or interview, which included a letter of introduction written by the family's patron, local official, or the soldier's father. The probato also established the precise legal status of the recruit. If they passed the interview, they could proceed on to the medical examination, in which a minimum height standard had to be met. However, standards began to fail due to shortages in recruits. There was also a preference of occupations. Blacksmith, wagon makers, butchers, and hunters were all very welcome. However, other professions associated with women, like weavers, confectioners, or even fishermen, were less desirable. When one was finally accepted into the military, he would receive an advance pay. The Roman army is composed of about 30 legions, each containing 5,500 men. Every legion had 10 cohorts that each contained six centuries. Centuries were composed of 80 men that usually traveled in groups of eight. These groups, called contubernium, would fight, march, work, and camp together. They would share a tent and a mule together and would fight as a unit. The first cohort, however, strayed from this organization. There were 800 men instead of the usual 420, and there were five centuries instead of six. The extra men were specialists such as blacksmiths. With a huge group like this, leadership was essential. The commander for the legion was called the legatus, and he typically served for three to four years. The commander over each century was called a centurion. The first centurion in the first century of the first cohort was the highest ranked centurion. The 60 centurions in the legion were easily distinguished by their sideways horse hair on top of their helmets and by the distinguished medals on their chest. They also carried a special stick that was used for beating disobedient soldiers. Similarly, the deputy centurion, who was called the optio, or chosen man, carried around a staff for prodding soldiers into formation. To tell the optio apart from the centurion, he would have a black and white plume on top of his helmet. There were other positions in each century, such as the tesserius, who was in control of guard duties, the signifier who kept track of pay, and the consignium, who blew the horn. Clearly, everyone who marched with the Roman army had a special job and place. Another very important position were the standard bears, men who wore animal skins of lions, wolves, and bears while carrying standards. A standard was a long pole with badges or flags that symbolized Roman honor. There were different kinds of standards. For example, the standard bearing the image of the emperor, carried by the imaginer, was meant to help the soldiers feel more courageous. Then, the eagle was the standard of the first legion and was the biggest disgrace if another army captured it. The spear, known as signum, was also carried throughout the centuries by the signifier. It was composed of filarae, or discs, and topped with a manus, or hand. The Roman army is well known for their formations and tactics. When the legion would attempt to siege on a city, it would cut off the enemies from their resources. As a Roman military maxim states, to distress the enemy more by famine than by sword is the max of consummate skill. The fleet had three steps in conquering a city. One, conquer as much territory as possible. The more land you have equals a greater food supply for the army, which equals less food for the enemy. 
cut it two, cut off the enemy's resources. And three, take the city by force. When the Roman army was facing the enemy head on, they used tactics such as the first through seventh formations. A general whose troops are superior in number and bravery should engage in the oblong square, which is the first formation. This tactic, designed for level terrain, assumes that your wings are more powerful. Should the enemy make their way around your flanks, the reserves will be able to counter. Once their wings are vanquished, you may press the center. He who judges himself inferior should advance his right wing against his enemy's left. This is the second formation. This formation, considered by some to be the best, took advantage of the fact that the left side of a soldier and the left side of the army were considered to be weaker because it had to support the weight of the shield. The right wing moved around the opponent's left and attacked from the rear. The left wing kept its distance while the reserves supported the left wing or guarded against the enemy attacking the center. If your left wing is strongest, you must attack the enemy's right according to the third formation. The third formation was considered something of a desperation move, to be used only when your left wing, usually the weaker side, was stronger than your right. In this attack, the left wing, supplemented by the Romans' best cavalry, attacked the opponent's right wing, while their own right stayed back in relative safety. The general who can depend on the discipline of his men should begin the engagement by attacking both of the enemy's wings at once, the fourth formation. The fourth formation's main advantage was its shock value. The entire army was brought close to the enemy, whereupon both wings charged at the enemy. This would often surprise the opponent, allowing for a quick resolution. However, the attack split the army into three parts. So if the enemy survived the attack, the center of the Romans' forces was vulnerable and the wings could be fought separately. He whose light infantry is good should cover his center by forming them in its front and charge both the enemy's wings at once. This is the fifth formation. This was a variation of the fourth formation. Light infantry and archers were placed in front of the center, making it far less vulnerable. He who cannot depend on either the number or courage of his troops, if obliged to engage, should begin the action with his right and endeavor to break the enemy's left, the rest of his army remaining formed in a line perpendicular to the front and extended to the rear like a javelin. This is the sixth formation. The sixth formation was similar to the second, with both having the right wing attacking the opponent's left from behind. In this attack, the enemy's left wing cannot be reinforced for fear that it would leave an opening for the Romans to exploit. If your forces are few and weak in comparison to the enemy, you must make use of the seventh formation and cover one of your flanks with either an eminence, a city, the sea, a river, or some protection of that kind. When the Romans were outnumbered or had inferior troops, this was often the only hope for victory. The left flank was kept guarded by whatever protection was available. The right was protected by the light troops and cavalry. With both sides well covered, the army had little to fear from an attack. They would also use formations such as the testudo or tortoise, which was a very strong, tight formation. Rumor has it that the foundation was so sturdy that men could walk on top of the shields and even horses and chariots could be driven over them. Another one was the wedge which cracked open enemy lines by legions forming into a triangle formation while they charged. During a battle, soldiers relied heavily on weapons. The army used heavy-duty weapons such as a battering ram, which was a log with a metal ram head at the end, which soldiers swung to break down fortresses. Another would be the ballista, which was a giant crossbow that fired iron-tipped bolts at 50 meters per second. Another Roman favorite was the onager, which was a catapult that could fire rocks weighing up to 150 pounds. These weapons caused some serious damage. The small-scale weapons were just as deadly. A Roman soldier always had two javelins, a sword, and a dagger on him. The pilum, or throwing spear, was designed so the javelin would bend on impact with the enemy's shields. This made it nearly impossible to pull the javelin out of the shield and disable the enemy from reusing the Roman's weapons. The gladius, or sword, was designed to be short to enable quick stabbing of the enemy. Lastly, the pugio was a small dagger worn on the soldier's left side. The soldiers were required to be trained in how to use these weapons and how to march. The first thing they were taught was how to march, at speed, in line, and as a compact fighting unit. During summer months, the trainees had to walk 20 miles in less than 5 hours time. They also had to learn how to swim. 
The weapons they used to train were wickerwork shields and wooden swords, which were two times as heavy as normal weapons. They would learn how to fight against wooden stakes at the beginning, advancing towards training against each other and using regular weapons. Finally, the soldiers were ready for battle. In order to provide max protection, Romans wore armor. This armor was known as Lorica Segmentata and was made up of overlapping metal strips to enable max protection and flexibility. The focale and singulum, or scarf and tunic, were worn under this armor. A helmet, or cassis, that protruded outward to deflect sword blows from the head was seen on every soldier. Even their shoes, or calidae, were specially designed. Studded conical hobnails lined the bottom of the soldier's leather shoes. They not only preserved the quality of the leather, but provided a grip on rough terrain and a weapon for soldiers. This was because Roman soldiers would step on the faces of their fallen enemies with these deadly shoes. Another important piece of armor was a soldier's shield. The shield was a curved oval shape made by gluing two sheets of wood together and binding it with canvas and leather. A Roman would hold a shield with their left arm, holding it straight out while angling it towards one shoulder during the charge, sometimes kneeling and fighting behind it. Despite popular belief, Rome had their fair share of losses. In fact, the greatest defeat ever suffered by Rome was the Battle of Cannae in 216 BC during the 17-year-long war between the Romans and the Carthaginians. This was called the Second Punic Wars. In this specific battle, Hannibal and the Carthaginians surrounded the Roman army and cut off their water supply, despite the Romans outnumbering the Carthaginians. Polybius estimated that 70,000 Romans were either killed or captured in this battle that lasted merely one day. Rome ultimately came out successful in the Second Punic Wars. Hannibal seemed to be undefeatable. With his army of elephants, he always held the upper hand. The favor did not seem to be in Rome's hands when they marched to Zama in Africa. Hannibal's army outnumbered Scipio's army 50,000 to 30,000. Despite the odds, Scipio outwitted Hannibal. When Hannibal's front line of elephants charged the Romans, the soldiers just stepped aside to make channels for the elephants to run through. The Romans were then able to kill the elephants instead of being stampeded by them. Since the elephants were not perfectly trained, some turned around from fright and started charging the Carthaginians. Scipio was clever enough to use his enemy's weapon against him. Even Hannibal shared his admiration for this Roman leader. Each of my Roman enemies revealed a weakness that I could exploit. I had outwitted, outfought, and outlasted all of them. But not Scipio. Scipio had imitated my strategy, copied my tactics, and now I saw just how well he understood me. He ordered the cavalry he had taken from me to seal our fate, just as we had done to them at Canada. At Zama, he used everything he'd learned from me to destroy me. After centuries of success, the Roman army finally met their end, the barbarians. When Rome refused hospitality to the, to the barbarians, the dispelled Germans attacked with such ferocity that the Romans did not know how to fight back. With all the land that the army had captured, it was only a matter of time before the empire fell apart. However, they left a legacy that will outlive the fatal mistake.